Hello everyone and welcome to another video. Now when we think of Intel's Extreme Processor Series, the Core 2 Quads often pop to mind, but during the release of their 600 series CPUs in 2006, Intel released the Core 2 Extreme X 6800, a dual core processor that was designed to be the top of the line chip, coming in at a price of $1,000, intended of course towards enthusiasts. What we have here is the ASUS P5NESLI motherboard. Now this board supports pretty much every single socket 775 CPU ever made by Intel. So what I thought we'd do would be to stick an X6800 in here along with 8GB of RAM and my 3GB 1060 and see just how well it performs in 2000 and almost said 17 then, in 2018. So let's get into it, talk about the chip and see what it can do when compared to some of Intel's other cheaper offerings. So the X6800 is a 2 core processor clocked at 2.93 GHz. Being an Extreme Edition chip it still sells for about £40 on AliExpress who ship worldwide. So the price will be the equivalent in your chosen respective currency. I think we can all agree that that seems too much. But it was the best CPU on the market as of July 2006, though for £800 or $1,000 it made no sense for anyone but enthusiasts to buy one, especially as the E6700 was half the price and only slightly weaker in performance. That can now be found for, well, quite a bit less, and most Core 2 duos will struggle with the latest games, but if like me the lore of the X6800's former fastest chip of all time title still makes you want one, then we should definitely move on to the benchmarks. The rest of the test system is a lot more powerful than any 2006 PC, but will allow our CPU to achieve its maximum potential. Being an X-series chip it would have been destined for overclocking, so I've upped mine to 3.4GHz, the highest I could get it on air. So, if you've got to add one of these to your collection, what can you expect from it? Starting with some CPU benchmarks first, and the X6800 scored 159 in Cinebench R15, a score that means it will perform similar to a stock speed E7000 series Core 2 Duo. You can see why it really isn't worth buying at its current used price for your main gaming rig. In Geekbench 4, the X6800 at 3.4GHz scored 2743 in the multi-core test and 1586 in the single-core test. Again, this means that this CPU wouldn't perform too differently to an E7000 series or E8000 series Core 2 Duo, running through my usual 30-second 1080p 60fps render test, and the X6800 completed the run in 42 seconds. Not extremely slow, and editing felt okay, though it may get frustrating after a while as you wait for the video preview to load properly before playing. For general use though, even in Windows 10, everything will work smoothly with web pages and HD video running flawlessly. So can it game? Well I started off with some older titles that should be no problem for such a chip. Crisis First as it came out just a year after this CPU and is still a challenge to run smoothly even to this day with modern hardware. The Core 2 Duo kept up just fine here and the game ran at 60 frames per second on average with a few micro stutters here and there. Graphically the high preset was used and overall the Core 2 Duo held its own while staying pretty cool too at 52 degrees. The maximum for this chip as stated by Intel is 60 60.4. The Elder Scrolls Oblivion is another game that released closely to this CPU and a game that was considered quite intensive for certain hardware at the time. Keep your eye on the CPU usage in the top left corner to see how it holds up with our modern day mid-range graphics card. Although at no point was our CPU reaching 100% usage and holding back our GPU, the graphics card itself is barely being utilised which isn't unexpected when using something like the 1060. But what about modern games? Can our overclocked X6800 handle some of the most popular games out right now? I started off with The Witcher 3 at the lowest settings. In and around Novigrad, where you'll undoubtedly spend a lot of in-game time, we averaged 28 frames per second and it was a very choppy experience to the point of unplayable. There were also a few graphical glitches with shadows and textures, and even a lower resolution couldn't make up for the problems. 
With the rise of the Tomb Raider, I decided to play the game instead of running the benchmark as I felt it would give you a more realistic idea of what to expect. Despite the pretty decent average figure, the percentile 0.1% and 1% lows meant that the game didn't run very well across the mountain peak and wilderness level. PUBG has seen a few performance patches over the last few months and it seems that it's definitely helped improve things, but playing this game on a Core 2 Duo isn't a suitable experience at all. I don't ever remember a Core 2 Duo performing this bad with this game so I'll be looking into this a little more in the future but even at 720p the frame rate tanked. Finally I tested Fallout 4 which even at the lower resolution didn't run very smoothly and 1080p was not an option. The game struggled to get anywhere near 30 FPS even at the low preset so it seems Intel's once extreme offering falls short by modern standards which wasn't totally unexpected considering even the best Core 2 duos struggle these days. The chip just like Intel's other X series offerings will always be special to me even if they aren't very good anymore because of what they once were, absolute powerhouses for dedicated enthusiasts and it's still cool to have something like this in your collection but I really wouldn't go out and pay £40 for it for any other reason, especially when a later Core 2 Duo CPU will outperform it and they cost just a few bucks. So guys, thank you very much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this look back at the X6800, a CPU I hadn't actually heard of until about last week. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a like on it. If you didn't, leave a dislike on it. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. Thank you, and hopefully I'll see all of you in the next one.